getting into Wheel of Time. Okay. I actually did read this today, so that's good. And I found this to be a relatively short, relatively low event chapter. It's really much more of a transition chapter with a few little things that are important in it. Yeah, I'm sure I can flush that out into a 75-hour uh, discussion. That'll be fine. Oh, yeah, on these, <laughs> on these six pages of content? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. All right, so this is Chapter 17, The Wheel of a Life, and the symbol is the Dragon Banner. And I just wanted to say that the Wheel of a Life is actually based on a Lewis Theron quote from a previous chapter, mm -hmm. where he says, The Wheel of Time and the Wheel of a Man's Life turn alike without pity or mercy. Which I believe is the last line. Yes, the last line of this chapter also. Mm-hmm. It's a, he, not the full line. Yeah. He says part of he, it. He repeats the theme. It's <laughs> Luce Theron is very on that for this day of the story. No pity or mercy. And I, th I think that references... Uh, I think that references Mangan because his life has turned without... Like, his life just ends without any mercy or pity. Like, it just... He violates the rules. Yeah, this is, this is an important chapter because this is the Mangan chapter. This is the chapter where mm -hmm. we actually have that entire story that sticks with us so strongly for the entire series and sticks with Rand so strongly. We also see Rand in a very flamboyant use of sighting sort of phase. This is when he's flinging sighting around all over the place and being very extravagant with it. We see a lot of creeping madness and LTT. Uh, this is also the chapter in which Rand thinks it would make it would be easier to have a mad voice in his head if it made sense. This is that chapter where he says that. There's lots of little fun details in it, totally. And we also see pre-Chafail. This is a chapter where yes. the people who become Chafail get introduced, which is pretty fun. The Maidens of the Sword. Yeah. And otherwise, it's, yeah, it's a lot of setting up the different towns that, or the different cities that Rand is going to bounce around and create the whole void in which do my as well as possible. So uh, I'll read us in as he gateways into the Sun Palace in Kyrian. Gathering his sword belt from beside the throne with the flow of air and the scepter too, Rand opened a gateway right there before the dais, a slash of light that rotated, widening to give a view of an empty dark panel chamber more than 600 miles from Camelin. In the Sun Palace, the royal palace of Kyrian, set aside for his use this way, the room held no furnishings but dark blue floor tiles and wood-paneled walls glistened from polishing. Windowless, the room was bright anyway. Eight gilded stand lamps burned the day and night, mirrors magnifying the oil-fed flames. He paused to buckle on his sword while Sulin and Urien, Urien opened the door to the corridor and led veiled maidens and red shields through before him. In this case, he thought their caution ridiculous. The broad corridor outside... The only way to reach the room was already crowded with 30 or so Fall Aladizar Dean, Brothers of the Eagle, and nearly two dozens of Berylane Manners, red-painted breastplates and rimmed pot-like helmets that came down to the nape of the neck and the back. If there was one place anywhere that Rand knew he needed no maidens, it was Kyrien, even, so, even more so than Tyr. I'll stop there. <laughs> Just a quick, you know, every, he's basically gatewaying into a stronghold where he's already surrounded by a bunch of guards. Yeah, it's a pretty secure situation overall. <laughs> like on the, you know, we see that Rand is very arrogant throughout this book and that he totally underestimates how vulnerable he can be. But I got to say, this is a pretty secure situation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless something's changed while he was gone. That's the one thing that he can't, right. you know, what, what if some Forsaken came in and decimated this area? Right, because there's only one exit out of this room. Mm -hmm. So, you know. It, it could be a trap. <laughs> Could be. You never know. But so far, I think I think his travels, it's hard to predict. He definitely is traveling on a whim, so it would be very hard to have that set up. For sure. But we also are seeing when he thinks that their caution is ridiculous. No, it's not, Rand. Right, right. Don't know if you missed the memo, but you are the most important person in the entire world. There's no caution that is too ridiculous. You know, and I was just thinking, looking at this, this book is a series of hits on Rand's psyche. Like, from losing all his friends to being basically on draped by Alana, 
um, to here having to sentence a friend of his to death to, you know, then getting kidnapped in Dumai's Wells. Like, every chapter with Randall in it is just another hit to his psyche. Yeah. Part of the reason he's in Kyrian is he's fleeing Alana. He's trying to get away from that touch on his mind. And he describes that so creepily, that like a touch just, just above the back of his neck that he can't quite get rid of. Yeah, he thinks about her very randomly a lot in this chapter. He is not at all settled in that situation yet. Well, what are we? This is still the same day, right? Yeah. <clears throat> or no, is it a couple days later? I can't remember. I think he traveled to the palace to get away from her. Just to get some distance. He talks with the nobles and gets his story about being Tigrain's son. So I think there's at least one night, but it's still very recent. It's just a series of blows on Rand. And I mean, we should probably figure it out at some point how long this book actually takes. But it's not that long. And it's a lot of blows on his psyche to happen in not that much chronological time for the story. It really sucks. <laughs> we also see here uh, he gets very like nihilistic and very Elon. With uh, what Luz Theron is thinking, you never escape the traps you spin yourself. Only a greater power can break a power, and then you're trapped again, trapped forever, so you cannot die. Okay, Elon, <laughs> calm down. Yeah, that seems very nihilistic. It, and and also with Luz Theron, right? I mean, this is the whole idea of, like, am I going to go insane and break the world again? Am I going to kill all my loved ones again? Like, that's that's the sort of thought pattern he's in, is, like, I'm just going to do the same things over and over again. And if what, you know... If I break out the cycle, what do I do? I sell my soul to the Dark One? Well, that's even worse. You know, there's just no way out. Yeah. Trapped forever so you cannot die. That's what's, that's the greater power I think he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah, LTT is trapped in Rand's head, right? Like, that, there's the, that lingering, like, you're just, he's just glitching, right? Like, Rand gets to look at that and be like, oh, that sucks. I don't like that. So then we get this guy. I am uh, Corman of the Mosada Goshine. He played Knives with Matt, but we never see him again. Mm -hmm. So he just, you know, pretty minor character. Yeah. Yeah, I looked him up too, and it's like, hmm, no, nope. he shows up for flavor. That's it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Haven Norell. Oh, no. Javi and Norella is around, dude. Javi and Norella shows up over and over again as, like, a Theta character. He's important in a way that Corman is not. He's a huge part of Perrin's whole trip with getting Fael back. Oh, Okay. Yeah, Javi Nerella is part of getting Rand back from Dumai's Wells, and from that gets elevated to being, like, very... He's considered important already to Berylaine, but especially in Perrin's eyes, because they go through Dumai's Wells together. And then he's one of the main generals, basically, of Perrin's army as he chases the Shido. It's funny, the, the wiki article is so short, and only mentions him a couple of times, but... Yeah, he is that, like, Theta character who's just around Perrin. Like, once once Perrin recruits him for Doom Eyes Wells, he just hangs around Perrin for a long time. Yep. And he becomes one of the one of the devotees of the Perrin anvil. One of the links in the chain, <laughs> in the blacksmith's puzzle, whatever you want to call all the, the weird cultures he puts together to create yeah. an incredible army. And he helps, you know, with keeping Aliandra's, you know, Lord Captain, whoever. He kind of helps, like, keep that guy calm, right? Because he's not as upset because his ruler didn't get kidnapped, but he's also the head of an army. So he's he helps Perrin negotiate his lack of desire to run the damn army. <laughs> gotcha. So, yeah, I think it's this is where we meet him. He gets so little glory in this series, but he shows up again and again doing critical shit, and this is where we meet him. Thanks for bringing him up to me, because I definitely assumed it was just another sort of nameless character that we were encountering in here. Not at all. But you could be forgiven for that, given that Cormun is a non-entity virtually. Right, right. And they're sort of introduced in the same sentence. Yeah, exactly. It's easy to not notice this guy, but that's what spoilers are for. Oh, but Lord Lieutenant of the Wing Guards, I see. Because he's because he's part of head of the Wing Guards, and Perrin uses the Wing Guards pretty much from then on out as part of his retinue. Yeah, when he gets sent away to get Masima, it's him and Berylane and Berylane's army. That's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Oh, Berylane. I you know. that one? Fucking Berylane. But the Winged Guards are a very important uh, seed for Perrin's army. Berylane and her whole island are really one of the best, her island, her island nation, or <laughs> I call it that. <laughs> isolated nation, by other countries. yeah. <laughs> yeah, isolated nation. Because there's so little power in that country, she becomes one of the most loyal followers of rand and helps him more than almost anybody else and Perrin as well mm -hmm. yeah she goes all in 
And as we see, like, they really do sort of, they bring trade back to Kyrie and they, like, they quell the riots. They bring order back to this country that's been just in chaos ever since Tom assassinated the king. Yeah. Berylaine is much like her, much like Kavian, she's not given nearly as much credit in the story as she actually kind of deserves because, like, a lot of shit would have fallen apart if she hadn't been able to step up and say, I'm not powerful, but I am knowledgeable. And that, so that gets lost in the, not controversy with Fayil, the conflict with Fayil. Yeah, and many characters discount her because slut-shaming, basically. Right, right. She's got boobs. Yeah, but particularly with Fayil, there's a lot of miscommunicated baggage happening there. Right, the two of them really need should have sat down and figured things out a lot earlier than they did. It would have saved... Well, the three of them, really. I should. <laughs> yeah, apparently should have just tried to seduce Fayil first. No, and yeah, then that, that you know i feel like it all would have just fallen out from there much better all right in the show do you think they'll just uh be a, a triplet couple i mean that would be a pretty big deviation from canon but i would love to see barrel just be by and have that factor into why people do or don't like her sure and maybe not fail so you can never really go there but... right but to at least have barrel try would be like an awesome way to help that because I mean honestly Perrin and Fayil's whole like the setup for that all that conflict like it's really awkward and weird and I feel like Barry Lane throwing just some wild abandoned flirting in there might make the conversation have less cringy directions to go in I'm actually really looking forward to I've been watching the boys because they released episode season two um, and they released the three first three episodes and this is Amazon Prime but they released three episodes at once and now they're doing weekly episodes I've heard about this. Which is good news because I do want to see weekly episodes Same. in the Wheel of Time. So the fact that they're not, like, that that now we have something that dropped weekly rather than just dropped all at once. Yeah. I, I'm very excited I, about that. And we need a week to process as a community. <laughs> yeah. I want to watch an episode and then sit down and be like, oh my god, for a day. And then I want to spend the next day being like, well, that means, oh, Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, when I see the first episode and I figure out what the hell they've actually changed, and I, I'm going to need a week to think through those implications. Oh, yeah. So much being a flutter needs to happen before the next episode mm -hmm. gets inputted into our brains. And I love the anticipation, right? The anticipation here is so great. If we get the whole thing, it'll just be this binge, and then, like, no, you know, we'll just collapse in a pile of our own... Um, anyway yeah uh happening. and it will just be done yeah like i don't i don't want to do that i want to like enjoy one and then like be teased a little bit more i mean even if they dropped it all at once i think i would just watch it once a week anyway and find three people that were willing to commit to that with me and we would just ignore the rest of the internet until we were done yeah wouldn't it be funny if what spoilers was deliberately like no spoilers <laughs> Yeah. I know you watch it. <laughs> and actually, you know, that's one thing I do want to make clear is we're going to have to put them, uh, when it drops, we're going to have to put a sort of mm, spoilerific type, maybe episode by episode discussion. Mm. Um, new channel for each episode so people can like talk about yeah. the episodes individually yeah. based on like how far along they are in the, se in the se sequence. Ugh, the logistics. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, we get a bit of a description about Kyrian. I didn't really have anything interesting to say. Yeah, they like order and just like flamboyance. We get it. Right, right. Square. Until uh, Louis Theron. I think we get the first instance of Louis Theron humming to an attractive woman here. Oh, and I also, th she wore the diadem of the first. Mm -hmm. That always reminded me, one of the horror cruxes in um, Harry Potter. Isn't mm -hmm. that the diadem of the um, Ravenclaw? Oh. Huh. And I have to wonder if they're not based on a similar history or some sort of similar story that I'm not very familiar yeah, with. Yeah, I could see a diadem with a raptor-type bird being a pretty common icon that you could find throughout historical and fantasy sources. Cool. Yeah, so that's something I'd, I'd be interested in if anyone had any, any links between this, the diadem of the first with the golden hawk and the, the diadem of, of Ravenclaw as the horcrux, other than both being diadems, which are basically tiaras as far as i can tell well, it's a fancy tiara <laughs> it's like more better for reasons <laughs> it's usually made out of precious materials not plastic <laughs> i'm sure there's some costumer who is yelling at their speakers right now who's like no Telling they have exactly all of the these difference. precise differences but yeah it's some sort of cool fancy headdressy thing that's pretty minimal and pretty that was really helpful i'm sorry 
But and so Rand yells at Lewis Theron, and he shuts up, which is I feel one of the early instances of them actually him communicating with his own insanity. Yeah, I definitely feel like we're seeing a lot of Rand playing with what would it mean if Luce Theron was actually a useful voice and not a symptom of insanity? What would it mean if Luce Theron was really in my head? Rand really wants there to be a voice that will step in <laughs> over his shoulder and fix everything, I think. Yeah, someone to help him. I mean, he's just, he's totally lost. And if there's this ancient hero with some idea of what went wrong before who can help him and come up with good weaves and you know, provide him information about his enemies. Like, that's that's definitely something to use. And at this point, he knows the information is real, mm -hmm. which makes him think the person is real as well. Yeah, he wants Luce Theron to be real at this point. So I think we see Luce Theron taking a lot of actions that would prove that he's real, like looking right. through his eyes or having, you know, prescient philosophical thoughts on what's happening. Or communicating. Yeah. Controlling his body. Blah. Right. I mean, but I think they really, they ramp up to communicating when he's in the box. Yeah, then for sure. Then he just starts talking to his own head. You know, then he's just, you know, talking to himself. This is laying the groundwork for being able to talk to Luce Theron in the box. We get a little bit about uh, Berylaine and Egwene just don't like each other, which I th reminded me of Min and Fael. Yeah, it is a lot like that. Just like, no, we can't be friends. We have too many of the same goals or something. I don't, I don't quite get the dislike. I feel like it's more prudish judginess than actual personality clashes but like you said it happens multiple times and not everyone has to get along right and that's kind of what i like is like they don't sometimes you just rub people the wrong way and you don't need to like them you know and like i, I like that he includes that every once in a while so there's no reason why they don't like each other they just don't yeah though i do think Egwene might have antipathy on elaine's behalf a little bit because barrelaine tried to seduce rand and elaine was offended by that so i think Egwene might be predisposed to not like barrelaine Mm. just out of loyalty well i think it's i think it's more of the two river slut shaming yeah idea. i think that's most just, of it yeah. <laughs> yeah but i don't want I'm to credit that consents the disapproval cause... and is like yeah i don't like you very much yeah i mean why would barreling care what some prudish farm girl thinks like okay fine right. <laughs> whatever which is super fair because slut shaming mm -hmm. is bad and min and fail they at first they didn't get along because uh min thought or naive bleh, because fail thought min was a threat right but then when she realized Min was in love with Rand, she was like, okay, she's not a threat anymore. But Min see, sort of sees just how cutthroat she is and how protective and jealous she is and is like, that's that's too much for me. Right. <laughs> she's like, the only reason you don't hate me is because I'm not a threat. I'm not really into that. That's not my flavor of friend. <laughs> right. Which is like super, super mood. I do not think I'd be friends with Fael either. That is way too much drama for me. And Fael always sees Rand Althor as a threat. Right, true, true. Always. She does not see Rand a, a friend. She sees a political threat. That's fair. And Min is so attached to Rand that I can see where those those two are gonna gonna butt heads. Yeah, they're just a, not opposed. They're just not aligned. Next thing I have is seeing the the maidens of the sword, as we call them, <laughs> uh, the the proto Cha Fael. Yeah, and there's men in that too. This group is all women, but Cha Fael has men in it too. So this is why I say it's pre Cha Fael. Because aside from Fael not being there, it's still very embryonic. Isn't it? Isn't it very interesting that Berylaine is the one who allows Chafael to flourish? I love that about her. I think that might have been when I started to really get sold on Berylaine my first time through. Was when she was like, no, I have faced down parents to defend these women's right to have self-determination. So fuck you. I love it. Young men always fight. But since they have begun this, not one has died in a duel. Not one. That alone is worth letting them go on. Besides which, I faced down fathers and mothers, some powerful, who wanted their daughters sent home. I will not deny those young women what I promised them. Yeah. It's powerful. It's yeah. extremely, like, she is someone who does what she needs to do, right? And she respects that, because these young people are roughly her age, right? Totally. And she's empowering them. Yeah. You know, she's she's empowering the women, especially, to, to take independence and, and do what they want to do. Of course, Rurik sees it as a, a bastardization of, of his principles because they're getting it all wrong. But, like, I agree with, with the rationale against so it. It's like, I'm sorry that you don't like seeing your culture adapted, but you've overtaken these people twice and they are impressed. Like, sorry that you're impressive, dude. <laughs> Deal with it. I want to make some parallels with Japanese after World War II and the American culture. Mm, I don't know much about that, but I know that that is a thing. That, like, after dropping a couple of atom bombs on Japan, you know, 
suddenly, <laughs> for some reason, a lot of people cared what the U.S. thought in Japan and what their culture was and stuff like that. Yeah, I've read there's like a, a, a romanticization of the American West and like cowboys and the, like all of that mythos like that we kind of think of as a little like quaint and old school now. It still has a lot of like cultural sway in Japan. I think it's why Japanese whiskey is so good. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I don't. I don't have the history chops to you know. This is where I need somebody who knows a little, a little something more about Japanese post World War II history. Um, I think it's it's an interesting thing to discuss. Like, it, what like is it wrong that the Aiel's customs are being taken in ways that they find offensive? Because like, if the power dynamic was different and the Aiel were on the receiving end of this power imbalance it would be really deeply offensive like truly to have their beliefs being Mm. taken and adapted but because they're the ones on top it's more like you can you can handle the offense i'm sorry but like just unruffle your feathers calm down yeah maybe a more appropriate analogy would be rome and the way that like they that when they conquered certain areas those areas would very quickly adapt to be part of the roman empire and very quickly become roman and because it's like oh this phalanx thing works real well and we like these aqueducts and it's nice not shitting in the streets Mm -hmm. you know it's like you get conquered and you see this this superior way of life maybe you adapt to it because it's culture right so it's personal but at the same time like what are you gonna do you're gonna stop people from appreciating the fact that like you're here and taking over their city like how are they supposed to not start Mm. emulating you and like barely said it stops them from killing each other like they're adapting ideal ways to their own temperaments and finding more productive ways of existing yeah uh, definitely a melting pot like sky lake says a cultural melting pot and that's a lot of what we see going on with the these massive armies and mixing of people Mm -hmm. and a parent does it especially a lot where he mixes all these cultures together and you know this melting pot of you know at least armies but i think there's no way that post last battle you're not going to have an incredible amount of mixing of cultures yeah it's already starting in the two rivers before the last battle Mm -hmm. oh yeah i mean that's because it is the geographic center of everything (laughs) that like it really does funnel in and becomes a, a major economic and political powerhouse Yeah, for sure. And then, yeah, the armies that do well leading up to the last battle are the armies with very diverse subdivisions within them, like Perrin's army. And, you know, Chafail, they are a very potent force, both for effecting change and for being, you know, military intelligence or whatever the fuck they're doing. So they're not they're not impressive yet, but they become very significant, if not massive, you know? Right, I mean, they become Fahil's spy network, uh, taken over by Balwar, right? Mm-hmm. I think like it's a little bit about Berylane and Ruark's uh, relationship when she sort of wins the argument. Ruark grunted sourly, and Berylane smiled. <laughs> Durant's surprise, for one moment, she seemed about to put her tongue out at the Aielman. Only his imagination, of course. <laughs> it's such a cute moment, because they really do have yeah. this, like, patient father and impatient daughter kind of vibe going, mm-hmm. and yeah, that, that moment is so adorable. <laughs> And you know they had this argument like a hundred times. And she was like, no, it's fine. And he was like, it's disrespectful. And then they finally go to Rand. And it's like going to dad and being like, pleading your side. And then being like, no, yeah, you know, let him him keep the toy. And he's like, I got to keep the toy. Right, right. And we see it too, like in a little bit when Ruark is kind of sitting back, puffing on his pipe and smiling as Berylane bustles around being an administrator. Like, Mm -hmm. they, they have a very acutely antagonistic relationship uh i like Yurian when rand's like i i think i'm safe uh nothing but mice around here and Yurian's like yeah mice about the size of a car <laughs> yeah the mice can be big here <laughs> mice can be big here yeah which i mean it's totally fair <laughs> but also really insulting to a Kyrian with his which is like yes calling them small but also calling them like a big mouse like that's the most threatening thing. It's 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 such a good Aiel insult. It's very Aiel, yeah. <laughs> that's like the Aiel humor to a to a T. I, I like that one a lot. We get to see the different ways that Ruark and Berylin have set up their room, which is just a fun looking around a room sort of scene. Not so much we need to go into, but it's nice detail when you're reading it. 
this is this is Robert Jordan, you know, spending a while on a dress or a room or this these this is the sort of heavy descriptive language that some people either hate or love, right, in this series. Mm-hmm. Which I really like it because it makes it it brings everything to life. You can really immerse yourself into it. Savor. But some people are like, let me get to the story. It's just too much. I just skip these paragraphs. However you want to read it, I think it's totally valid. Yeah. It's very savorable though. But this is the kind of stuff when people are like the TV. When people, how are you going to fit a TV show in? It's like, well, you remove all this stuff just, and you can see it. Yeah, yeah. This is a panning shot across a room, right here. Right. <laughs> right. Or not even that. Just a description of the room they happen to be interacting in. You mm-hmm. know, which is good information for the set designers. Exactly. But it can be done with like plot can be happening over it. You know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Totally. And then there is talk of Caroline Domondred and Torum Riotin in the streets. Mm-hmm. And so I was actually looking into them. Caroline Domondred, of course, is Moraine's sister. Cousin. Cousin. And she ends up marrying... Darlin. The king, Darlin Cisnera, who becomes the king of... Tyr. Tyr. First king of Tyr in a very long time. Right. It's a cool story. It is a very cool story. But what I found interesting is Torum Riotin. Mm-hmm. He, uh, that, he's there when Rand gets the slash on his side from fane and he runs off into the mist and he actually comes back as a fane puppet yeah and i completely miss that he comes back as a fane puppet that he like basically gets captured and used and his soul gets eaten um because the last we see of him is running off into the fog after rand gets the second slash and then you don't see him again to the last battle mm -hmm. yeah he gets he gets super fainified and 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 land kills him oh he does basically uh fane orders torum to attack Lan while he goes after Rand. Oh, I totally spaced that whole interaction. God, the last battle was such a blur. No, that's that's actually Winter's Heart, chapter thirty three in Far Matting. Torum Riotin is in Far Matting? Right? I had no idea uh, until I looked him up. So there's the two Ashaman, the two renegade Ashaman that are dead and not dead at the same time. Torum is also there? Winner's Heart, Chapter 33. I'm going to do a quick look up. I totally... Yeah, I went Skylake. I thought it was Torval that was there, but... Torum, he's one of uh, Fane's thralls. I told you he's mine, the bony man screamed, dancing away from Rand's cut. With his face contorted in fury, his big nose and ears that stuck out made him seem something contrived to frighten children, but his eyes held murder. Mine! Padden Fane shrieked, leaping back again as Lan rushed into the room. Kill the ugly one! Only when Lan turned away from Fane did Rand realize that someone else was in the room, a tall, pale man who came to almost eagerly meet the warder blade to blade. Torum Riotin's face was haggard, but he flowed into the Dance of Swords with the grace of a blade master he was. Lan met him with equal grace, a dance of steel and death. God damn! Okay, I consider myself schooled. So Fane went ahead and captured him in the the mist and, uh basically used him as probably uh, one of his thralls as a blade master for quite some time. Right, cuz when we see them at the at the camp with the rebels, it looks like Torum and Fane have been together for a while. So Fane had a t- had time to work on him and get like good possession of him. It's not like That's touch a of point. a hand possession. Or it's not instant, right? Like, some people, he just, like, mm-hmm. grabs them. But Torum, I think he gets to do more of the, like, insidious advisor thing and then grabs him. Right, right. So Torum is really the third major. Because we've seen him with Lido, we've seen him with Fane, and now we've seen him with Torum. Is there anyone? And Niall, yeah. So the fourth major influence. Yeah, well, Turak, Elida, Niall. Also, what's his face with the White Cloaks in the Two Rivers with Bornhald? And then with Torum. Man, Fane gets around. Yeah, Fane is, he does. <laughs> what an evil slut. Ugh. Yeah, we can shame that slut. Ugh. <laughs> shame him more for being evil than for being slutty. So yeah, at this point, Toram probably has only just met up with Fane or is about to meet up with Fane. Because he's still with Caroline and all of that. That hasn't fallen apart yet. Mm-hmm. And the last, last we saw Fane was when Fane was fleeing the two rivers from parents' successful foiling. Mm-hmm. So he's on his way, so probably, Perrin, to Toram. Yeah, if anything, he probably... Because Perrin gets here shortly thereafter, and we know Perrin hung around in the two rivers for a while. So, yeah. It's, do, uh, does Perrin use the ways to get to Rand? No. Okay. No, he marches over He does the long that. trip. He only does that yeah. because he thinks that the Trollocs are going to, you know, flay everybody alive. It's the only reason he goes through the ways. 
We get a little bit of talk of the Shido. They do not think the Shido ever mean to return to the Threefold Land. And they don't until they get killed. And then the last remnant of them goes. The remnant of their remnant. After the Battle of Malden. Before that, I was... Okay, so Rand is thinking about uh, Darlin's rebellion in addition to Torum and Caroline. And he says that he thinks Niall's hand might be in that rebellion as it is with Darlin. I don't remember Niall being involved in either of those rebellions. No, I don't think he is. But the line is here. Rand thinks that he is. Why does Rand think that? It says Niall's hand might be there as well as with Darlin. It's at the end of the first paragraph on that page. It's, yeah, I, I don't know why Rand thinks that. I mean, just possibly the White Cloak's influencing folks. I don't, I don't know. I think he's just... Yeah, Rand seems very sure that Niall is involved, and I'm like, what are you smoking? Well, I mean, it says Nile hand, Niall's hand might be there. Oh, as it was with Darlin. So he's pretty sure it is with Darlin? I see what you mean. Yeah, which I'm just like, really? Is that a thing? I, just, I didn't think Darlin was remotely associated with the White Cloaks ever. I mean, he's in open rebellion and had Merc. Uh, Lord of Chaos, Chapter 9. Balwer reports to Nile that Astanda and Tissodian have joined Darlin in open rebellion. Yeah, so that's a spymaster report. That's not having a hand in it. No. In Tyr, Balwar's agents had convinced Tedosian and Astanda to join Darlin, turning a show of defiance into real rebellion. Okay. Okay. Darlin isn't actively working with them, but they are still pushing on the situation he's involved in. Mm hmm. They basically gave him enough allies to make his sort of minor act of defiance into something real. I wonder if Darlin ever knew. I wouldn't think so. I don't so. think so either. I think that's why I'm so confused about this, because Darlin never once reflects on it. But Rand somehow has a clue that that's happening. Probably because of Tadosian and Nastanda being not likely to do that without some pressure. That's where Rand's just real smart. And has spy masters like Moraine and Tom giving him advice, even if they're not actively there. He's at least thinking the way they taught him. Man. Okay, thank you for helping me untangle that. Because, yeah, Darlin has... No, I was like, Darlin doesn't have any dealings with Yeah, Darlin. Darlin's awesome. And we know Darlin's that. an awesome right. dude. He's totally motivated for the right reasons, blah, blah, blah. Like, don't taint Darlin. Right. But his his little act of principled rebellion got a boost. Right. From unprincipled sources. <laughs> um, and then I feel like we get a bunch of really interesting information about Shara. Yes. Which... Since we know that when the fighting starts in Shara, that's when Demondred essentially goes and kills the rulers and takes over. Right after Grandal snags the Shaboa and Shabote. Yeah? Exactly. Yep, yep, because we just saw that in the in the beginning of this one. And yeah, so I guess that that is the canon, is the the, the Sh Shabote and Shaboan are gone. I wonder if that's why the fighting really started. For all the story we get here is because of the news of Rand. Like, how much of it had to do with their peop their rulers just vanishing overnight? And I think that also, I think Demondred is there. Right, right. Messing with things. So, I mean, it's it's kind of that they're to the dragon and kind of that the Forsaken are there fucking with them. And I mean, it could also be that Demondred is making sure that news of the dragon is creating chaos, right? That would be very like him. <laughs> And they do have prophecies about the dragon, right? Their prophecies is that Demondred will, you know... Right, dragon him, slayer. Right, he's, he's, he's the dragon slayer. So, you know, once they hear about the dragon, I'm sure that, yes, their prophecies uh, triggered a bunch of stuff as well. So, yeah, you never know. I mean, I'm sure hearing about the dragon wasn't... Right, that was never going to be a neutral event. But the, the kidnapping and destruction of their leadership, I'm sure, created a power vacuum that meant that the news caused all sorts of chaos and war, which Demondred is going to take advantage of. Do you think Grandal took those people before Demondred showed up or after? I think it was one of those things where they're working together. Oh, you think they actually coordinated the timing of that together? Absolutely. Yeah, that would that would make sense. She's like, I'm going to go get some pretties. And he's like, good, <laughs> I'll go take over the country. And a one, two, chaos! Ride an army, <laughs> right. And because we saw how much, when uh, Samael was talking to Grandal, we saw how much she was hinting that uh, Demon Dread was in Shara. She, like, dropped so many hints that Demon Dread was in Shara. And we know he's there. Right, and she even says they're working together to some extent. She even lets that go. So, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, she probably showed up, and then the next day he showed up. Like, wah. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm very anti the Tom and Dredd theory is because there's so much evidence that uh, Jordan had already put Demondred in Chara. Mm-hmm. That while, well, yes, it was in the notes that maybe he had that idea, I do think he had separated those characters, put Demondred in Chara at this point, and, and left Taim in the Black Tower as a, a dark friend. Yeah, I think you just needed to be slightly more thorough in excising that idea from what he wrote. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where it, it, there's there's maybe one too many red herrings, one too many so-called Aeels. But yeah, I agree. It's it's very clear at this point that Demondred is firmly ensconced in not Andor. Now, he's building up this big hammer in Tyr, but that's not, you know, as we've always said, that's not his plan. His plan is to uh, hit Samael from the back while he's paying attention to this big army in Tyr. He never expects that army to actually attack Ilion. Of course, it all goes to waste because of what we were just talking about, the fog and Tor- Torum Riotin and Fane cutting him in the side <laughs> because Rand is inca- incapacitated during the window of time when he wanted Samael to be distracted. Yeah, that whole timeline gets sort of completely... Right, and that's why, you know, the end of this book is not when he fights Samael. Yeah. You, you spend... Because I think that's actually kind of brilliant of, of one of the reasons this book works so well is at the end of each one of the past books... Rand has gone up against one of the Forsaken, fought them, and won. And that's become very much like every. He's getting boring at this point. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Then you're expecting, all right, well, the next one's going to be Samael. Mm -hmm. Let's tee it up. Let's get the army ready. And then he's like, nope. Kidnapping. (laughs) Actually. Rand Rand in a box. (laughs) Do my as wells. And you're like, whoa! That came out in such a a twist. Right. Yeah. No, it's such a twist from what you're expecting. Um, And I think a big part of that is. Your expectations that he's going to be fighting Samael at the end of this uh, this book. Yeah, Rand's hubris ends up bleeding over into your expectations as a reader for how the book will go. And then when Rand gets disabused, you feel equally betrayed, if in a slightly less intense way. You expect, you, you know, he's he thinks he's in control and you think you're in control of the story. You think you know what's going to happen next. Yeah, and then it's like, is Rand going to survive the series at all? <laughs> <laughs> like if, and if he does, is he going to be even close to sane when it happens? Yeah, are we going to wish that he had died before this series is over? Right. Like, you right. really start to have terra firma be not so firm under your feet at the end of this book. And you can you can really see the insane Louis Theron going out and, like, maybe killing all of these people I've come to know and love if Rand really mm-hmm. snaps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very scary. Oh, God, especially when um, the My Hands, I can't use my hands oh. scene where Lewis Theron is in control, complete control of the channeling. 100%. Yeah. That is a terrifying scene as well. Rand is a atomic bomb with a hair trigger. Yeah. Just rolling dice. Just, uh... <laughs> It's no wonder people sometimes are on, you know, tiptoes around him. Yeah. yeah being around Rand is, is a serious gamble in another two months or so. Um, we see a little more updating on Kyrian. She thinks they're, uh, Berylane thinks they're going to be self-sustaining by next year if the weather ever breaks, instead of all the grain he's been sending down from Tyr. Mm-hmm. And this trade seems to be resuming now that Kyrian's no longer in complete rioting chaos, which is important because you need to be able to food and commerce and all that kind of stuff to, to bring a country back online. Yeah. It's nice, even as the world is falling apart, all it takes is semi-competent administration and things will start to right themselves. Mm-hmm. And then this last section. Everything's all brisk and shiny and there's a school doing well and oh, academia is a pain. And then bucket of cold Mangan. water to the face with Mangan. And what I didn't realize is this is like four or five paragraphs. Like this is an, inc- it's like a page. Yeah. And it, it's such a meaningful, it stuck with me so much because there is a lot going on in this single page. This is the Aiel equivalent of Sarah Coventry. Uh, expand on that. A character who you see for one scene and whose death is so profoundly tragic that it's one of the most singularly memorable characters out of the entire thousand part background chorus. Gotcha. And who was that character that you said? Sarah, is it Coventry or Coventry? I can't remember if there's a T. Oh, Sarah, the, the apprentice. Yeah, Sarah, the the... She's not even an accepted. She's a novice. But she brings Min to see Swan 
and Swan wants to hide that Min is there. So she sends Sara off to a field and Sara ends up being tortured to death before she ever gets to go back to the tower. Yeah, this is a similar chord. Sort of, the only difference here is like Mangan is a character who you've seen before. Like he's been on screen quite a bit. Yeah, this is maybe, maybe Sara is, so he's like Sara, but he's also like Pevin. Very much like Pevin and same thing. Just like shows up, breaks your heart, leaves. So you're right. We do. Do we actually see Mangan on screen before, or are we just hearing about how? Oh yeah. I, I want to say we do see Mangan in like the initial, one of the initial like aftermath of the stone being conquered scenes or something. But it's so short. And then he comes back he's here. Young, and, he's yeah. younger and taller than Rand. So younger than Rand. Oof. He's just one of the first to follow Rand. That's what it is. Yeah. He's in the Stone of Tear. He like was the first person to pledge himself. And it's one of the deaths that we actually get to see Rand suffering from as it happens. Most of the time, Rand, like, compartmentalizes and pushes it aside and puts it on the list. And this is one of the times where he doesn't have those barriers and you just see him falling apart on the inside. Him will I hang. Him will I hang. It's just... Uh. Yeah, you know, like we said, blow after blow. He flees Alana and he gets hit by this. Yeah. Talk about dropping an anvil on your foot to get rid of a headache. And so, yeah, Mangan killed a man for having an Aiel chief tattoo. So, you know, for all of you out there who have gotten Aiel chief tattoos, watch out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't piss off an Aiel. Make sure your arms are covered. If you see any redheads with spears. But yeah, no, I mean, he, he completely just killed him because he had the tattoo. He was drinking and showing off his tattoo. And he presents it as... I killed a man, so I owe you toe. I have toe to you, Randolph Thor, because you said the law, and Rand shocks the Aiel sensibility by saying, you have toe to the man you killed. Right, which is just seems totally wrong to them, because fighting a man is never something that gives them toe. If anything, he has toe for being killed. Yeah, in Rand's worldview, there's no good reason for murder. You know, he has a much more tinker approach to, like... You need to convince me murder was justified. The Aiel are like, convince me it wasn't justified. They're much more comfortable with killing over honor in a way that Rand is, uh, he's not comfortable with that. And it's, it's a really big, it shows you the huge divide, right? Between Rand and the Aiel that he keeps stumbling over and over again. He was pretending to be a clan chief. Rand realized he was searching for an excuse. Hi. He will I hang. Mangan had been one of the first to follow him. No, Mangan said. He was drinking and showing off what he should not have had. I see your eyes, Randall Thor. He grinned suddenly. It is a puzzle. I was right to kill him, but now I have toe to you. You were wrong to kill him. You know the penalty for murder. A rope around the neck, as these wetlanders use. Mangan nodded thoughtfully. Tell me where and when. I will be there. May you find water and shade today, Randall Thor. May you find water and shade, Mangan, Rand told him sadly. I suppose, Berylain said when the door closed behind Mangan, that he really will walk to his own hanging of his own accord. Oh, don't look at me that way, Ruark. I don't mean to impunge him, or I yell honor. Six days, Rand growled, rounding on her. You knew why he was here, both of you. Six days ago when you left it to me. Murder is murder, Berylain. She drew herself up regally, but she sounded defensive. I am not used to men coming to me and saying they have just committed murder. Bloody G.E. Toe. The Eelmen and their bloody honor. The curses sounded odd coming from her mouth. You have no cause to be angry with her, Randall Thor, Ruark put in. Mangan's toe was to you, not to her, or to me. His toe was to the man he murdered, Rand said coldly. Ruark looked shocked. The next time somebody commits murder, don't wait for me. You follow the law. That way, perhaps, you would not have to pass sentence again on a man he knew and liked. He would if he had to. He knew that, and it saddened him. What had he become? The wheel of a man's life, Lewis, Th Lewis Theron murmured. No mercy, no pity. So sad. Which was the reference to the wheel of time and the wheel of a man's life turn alike without pity or mercy, is the full quote that he used in the last chapter. Yeah, so sad. That's a... F that's it, rough. It's a death of a man but it affects Rand as profoundly as the death of a woman. It's it's ordering the death of a friend. Yeah. It's him having to separate Rand the ruler from Rand the person. That compartmentalizing. Oof. 
cold reasons. Smoke is bad. Smoke is terrible. We are f- smothering in it. Yes. So I was just saying before we kicked on recording that I had spent the worst day of smoke helping my neighbors move uh, for cash. And it was one of those things where they were planning on moving that weekend, but because of the fires, they could only get a U-Haul during a certain time. And it happened to be during the worst of the smoke. So that was a rough, rough weekend for me. Fortunately, I don't smoke <laughs> cigarettes. <laughs> what? I was going to say, wait a second. You and I both love smoke, just mm. not cigarette smoke. I have felt really bad, though, for cigarette smokers. Like, this is a very stressful time, and you either have to go outside and get, like, eight times the crap in your lungs, or smoke indoors, or suffer nicotine withdrawal. These are all very shitty options. Or go with the patch or whatever. I oh, think yeah, true. the only blessing is that some people actually use the beginning of quarantine to quit smoking. Well, I mean, anything that gets people to make that choice is good, but I feel bad for people who haven't made that choice, and it's like, well, what are you going to do when you're trapped at home? Like, (laughs) you know? Totally. Fuck. Yeah, Satanus is saying he quit about six months ago. Right. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations on that. That has been an excellent journey to observe, but... And I know Patrick quit around the same time, successfully. The challenge of having that not have been a six-month work in progress... When this smoke situation suddenly comes rolling through on top of every other thing. I think the fact that bars aren't open was actually a huge boon. Like, people weren't going out drinking and then, you know, lowering mm. inhibitions and smoking and not be, not able to bum smokes and, like, having to go outside to, like, buy a pack. All of those things kind of contributed to just a bunch of barrier to entries for yeah, smoking Just again. make it a little bit difficult. And it's easier to not. But, yeah, I'm, yeah, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I... Definitely am not stopping smoking weed while I have to stare at these walls even more than I already was. And my parents are pretty close down to the fires. They're down in um, uh, Grants Pass, which is... Oh, yeah. Southern Oregon's been getting scorched. Hammered. I had an yeah. a, a acquaintance um, who's been driving down back to Arizona from being up here and yet giving us reports on passing through Southern Oregon was just... Oof. Yikes. Mm-hmm. No, I feel safe in Portland, if only because, like, it's where all the refugees have to come. It's, like, the one place where they really can't, like, let it burn down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of where I'm at, too. It's uh, people have been coming here from coastal towns. They've been, you know, Lincoln City and stuff. They've been coming here. The topography of where I'm at is quite safe. But, oh, my God, we've been at the intersection of two different plumes where, like, the two things are, like, spreading out, that one of those intersections has been right over where I live for days. It's been so fucking gross. Ugh. I actually watched a map of, like, an animated map where you can see kind of the density of the smoke. Like, it's very obvious in the texture. And it's like, oh, look, there was a thick stream of really nasty smoke that just was over, parked over us for, like, a day and a half, just solidly right over my town. Like, that explains why it's disgusting. Lovely. Totally. And, and what we're getting is the smoke that went out over the Pacific Ocean that's now, like, coming back. Right, now it's coming back. Yeah, first it was going out directly over me, and now it's like, yay, it's blowing west again, but that means we get to rebreathe it mm-hmm. all over again. Twice. We get to breathe it twice. And I, uh, apparently there's a temperature inversion as well, so because mm-hmm. the smoke reflects the or absorbs the light, it can't get down to the ground. So the, the air here at ground level is quite cool which means it stays down. Yeah. And so then we have this wind blowing. It's supposed to be blowing the smoke away, but it's just passing right overhead and not doing anything to disperse the smoke. It's just sitting on us. Yeah. And then the coastal humidity has come in and helped make fog, which makes the smoke more white, which increases its albedo. So it's reflecting even more of the heat and everything. And uh, yeah, it's been a very, very bizarrely cold September. Yeah, it's almost like going to be like the the earliest fall Oregon's going to have because we're I, you know we were supposed to have a hundred degree temperatures last weekend mm-hmm. in the forecast and it was like what sixty 
Yeah, and all the onshore wind has been super weak, so it's like we're getting this very like lackadaisical sort of like slow trickle of fresh air, and it's it's slowly trickling east. You know, we've got all the way to the east coast. The smoke has finally reached, but the bulk of it is still just pooled here. Oh yeah, I've heard they they're detecting it in. I heard they detected it in like Germany. Yeah, I can believe that from some of the maps I've seen mm-hmm. for sure, like, like the aerosols. Seeing, like, yeah, some haze and stuff. Like, I'm sure that I'm not even smelling it as much as it really is happening. I'm good at just ignoring it. But, like, oh, my God, guys. It's been, like, breaking the scale for AQI for, like, four, five, six days. So what's been helping us is we are boiling a pot of water to constantly being releasing steam into the apartment and then also running the air conditioner to pull the water out of the air. Is that actually helping? It seems to be. I'm not sure how much of that is... um... Placebo. Call it placebo. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've been skeptical. I keep reading that online, and I'm like, really? I don't know. But to me, I mean, it makes sense. You you put water droplets in the air that interact with the smoke. Then you condense them on the air conditioner, and the water drips out of the bottom of that, containing the smoke particles. Yeah. The science makes sense. In in theory, it's just yeah. And with a relatively small space, we can fill it full of steam pretty quickly, and then turn on the air conditioner and empty it out pretty quickly. And that helps. It seems to help. Because every time you open the door, we get this, like, burst of smoke smell in there. So I do know oh, it's yeah. much more concentrated outside. For sure. Yeah, it's weird. It's like every time we go out and then come back, you can smell how stale the air in the apartment is. Mm-hmm. It's like every time you change environments, you can tell, but then you quickly acclimate to wherever you're at. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't want to um, talk about what my bedroom smells like because I can't air it out. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, I can wash the sheets and wash everything, but when you can't air out, like, your room, you just, your stench tends to just accumulate. It's pretty gross. Yeah, houseplants are helping a bit, I think, mm. because they at least are putting out fresh oxygen, like, within the confines of the building, but... I think you'd have to really seal up the room for a very long time for that to be a problem. It's, yeah, I'm more worried about how much extra CO2 is in the atmosphere from the fires than I am about exhausting myself on my own exhalate. But, you know, there's a, I was looking at, um, Knoll School website and that has amazing maps on it. And there's one of carbon monoxide coming from the fires. You could see the footprints of the fires so clearly on that map and Mm. from carbon monoxide specifically. I'm just like, this is why everything is sluggish and slow and (laughs) headachey. fuck i i will say i've been suffering from like thunder head i looking them up thunder headaches like just you know if if my blood pressure goes up suddenly just feels like i get kicked in the back of the head mm-hmm. and i get this massive headache um, that'll that'll last for an hour or two and that's all been since the smoke appeared yeah. so it's it's bad it's definitely f- affecting me physically there's no doubt about it oh yeah i definitely can feel it just headaches are easier i'm more tired and sluggish and cranky even than normally being confined inside would make me it's well anyway i want to talk about audiobooks because one of the things i'm excited about is um, michael kramer and kate redding's they've been reading rhythm of war yes i've been enjoying their pictures (laughs) of their works in progress isn't it great because every day they they're posting an update every single day yeah i'm not excited about the book but i'm loving their updates (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're not why aren't you excited about the book? i just haven't gotten into any of sanderson's stuff particularly oh, it's just like i haven't of. gotten out the train yet i mean it's a good time book four of a series it's it's a good point but <laughs> it's a that yes M- michael kramer and kate redding and i know i know i'm just saying i'm just saying anyhow continue talking it up and making me feel bad you know he's only the guy that finished the wheel of time we doesn't deserve any respect whatsoever to read his content, especially his Wheel of Time, essentially homage. You know, I, I can't think of any reason why you would have any interest in that book whatsoever. But, you know, I recommend it anyway. Okay. It's like when you try and convince people to read Broken Earth, and like, I don't know, I'm not really yeah. that into it. And you're like, no, you really need to read Broken Earth. It's true. It's true. They're like, well, I don't know about that second person beginning. And it's like, no, just it, it makes sense. Push through it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's no. It's worth it in the end. Yeah. I, yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll get to it eventually, I'm sure. And, you know, how can you not love Michael Kramer and Kate Redding? It, it's so true. I absolutely adore them. 
And Kate does a, like, some of her voices are just so spot on. <laughs> I think you've probably heard me talk about it in the podcast before, but like the I am a stick and just a few other little things are just, oh my God. I think she's amazing in terms of like producing humor in her voice. And Michael Kramer does so many different voices so well that I lose th- that he's the one doing them sometimes. <laughs> um, for both of them, really, you know, like I don't hear Michael Kramer and Kate Redding anymore. I hear Rand. I hear Dalinar. I hear, you know, Pattern. I hear whatever the, the characters are that they're doing. Uh, yeah, no, it's not for it's a amazing. lack of interest. It's just there's just so many things to read. <laughs> that is not a lie. <laughs> it's not a good excuse so either. They there. are so talented. I have uh, The Fall is going to be a little nuts. My Audible collection is. Like, I pre-bought, like, six or seven books that are coming out. Oh, dear. <laughs> in the next, like, month or two. Because, like, this, like before December. Because, like, just everybody's dro- dropping a shit ton of good books. And sequels, um, you know, sequel to Rage of Dragons, Rhythm of War. Uh, that uh, there's, there's more. There's, there's a ton more. <laughs> there's a lot. Um, coming. There's a lot. So. Yeah, Rage of Dragons. I have that in my Audible library. I just, again, I have to get to it. I've heard a lot of good things. It's just I'm trying to get through other stuff. What are you working on right now? Uh, Pattern of Shadow and Light. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a bunch of print books that I'm also trying to make myself read, but they're all really heavy. So I keep putting them off and then being like, nah. But so I'm reading Underground. I'm reading, no, Underland, not Underground. Underland. And then also The Known World. And I really want to start braiding Sweetgrass. Also the second book of the that the the, the three body problem i really want to get started on book Mm. two of that i had trouble getting into three body problem that was one where i couldn't get really past the first couple chapters Mm, yeah it didn't really start clicking to me till right near the end for sure gotcha for sure it's it's again one of those ones like it's just such a slow burn but worth it yeah there's a lot of really interesting stuff though i do hesitate to recommend it because the author is okay with espousing some pretty problematic views on other things, so I don't want to encourage putting money into his pocket. Oh, I can avoid that. But definitely the story is very intriguing, and the approach of using science equations as the basis for dramatic storytelling is its intriguing, and it's from a totally different cultural context than I'm used to, so that gives it a very interesting flavor. Have you read The Poppy War yet? No, but again, on my list. I haven't actually possessed... I don't actually own it yet, but it is very much on my list. And I, I felt the same way about that as I do about The Three Body... As I think I felt about The Three Body Problem, where I, I really interest... As you're describing The Three Body Problem, I should say. Really interesting uh, take on stuff from a very different culture. Um, but it's a for me, it's a slow burn, and I wasn't super into it until... I was sort of done with it, and like then it sort of captured me. <laughs> but I haven't read the third book yet in the Poppy War, so that's on the list. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app, or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?